Well, we are re-recording because we had a computer issue the other night and um, was not aware it was not properly recording until after the fact. And uh, we had a, a great Bible study as we usually do and folks engaging, asking great questions and some great input they offer as well. And um, sorry, folks, this is the way this happens sometimes. Um, love-hate relationship with computers because when they're behaving well, it's awesome to have that kind of support and help and all that good stuff going on. But then uh, when it's not behaving well, you know, it's it's uh, that's where the hate comes in. So we are picking up in Revelation chapter 16, and this is where the narrative for the wrath of God picks up in earnest. We really kind of left off with respect to the wrath of God and the bowls back in chapter 11, um, where we had the seventh, the seventh trumpet sound, and the seventh trumpet opens the bowls. The, uh, we had the sanctuary in heaven, and there were thunderings and lightnings, and the angels were gathered around, and they're ready to um, come forth and bring the bold judgments. But then we stepped into a, uh, another parenthetical or a series of parenthetical chapters. And these parenthetical chapters pick up things like um, uh, who's who, who's doing what, what uh, the players are doing, the various actors the people involved, the demonic creatures involved, the beast. And we had, uh, you know, more forthcoming with the woes. We had, we had three woes, and they're all satanic, demonic type of activity, these woes. And so um, pretty horrific stuff. And um, in, the, in the last chapter, what we saw was... Um, let me open this up real quick. If you have your Bibles, you should be open. Take a quick look in um, Revelation 15. Revelation 15, we have this prelude to the bold judgments. And it kicks off again. It says, I saw something um, like a sea of glass mingled with fire and so forth, and it's all before the throne, and then you hear the song of Moses. And then in verse 5, After these things I look, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open, and out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands, then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels golden bowls full of wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. So here again is the similar language that we see in Revelation chapter 11, in verse 8. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So this is fascinating. A um, couple things here in um, chapter 15. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven legs of the seven angels were completed. Now, some folks like to look at the Pentateuch where we have um, the temple purification process that happens in the priesthood where the priest will go into the temple with the incense and and um, there will be a purification going on in the temple um, to make it ready. Um, I, I, I don't believe that this is purification here because we're talking about the temple of God. And really, do we think that the temple of God needs to be purified? Because I'm thinking, as opposed to the temple on earth, if there's any place in all of existence, where there is a temple that does not need purification, it's going to be God's purification. Um, now, 
what we've seen before, folks in the temple of God and before the throne of God, we see this on the sea of glass, and very often we, we will see the Ark of the Covenant there, the real Ark of the Covenant that's in heaven, the one we had on earth that was constructed um, under the direction of Moses was, uh, it was a copy, it was a replica, um, probably a, a very flawed, very temporal type of uh, replica, but it's where we are on a cursed earth. The one in heaven is the, the real, the original tabernacle in which ours here on earth is modeled after. So we, we see this, and we see people before the throne. We see angels before the throne. They're all there. Their eyes are fixed on God, rightly so, um, praising him, singing holy, 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 glorifying him, and, and everybody's just in awe, the, the radiance, the brightness of his glory, watching God in heaven. Well, there's something different kind of going on here, and what I think is going on is that we've reached a point in history there with the wrath of God. We're well and truly fully into... Um, the Great Tribulation, now the second half of Daniel's 70th week, um, known as the time of Jacob's trouble. So we're in this period now, and we're in the part that Jesus called the great, the time of Great Tribulation. So the, the key to remembering all of this is that this is Christ taking back creation. All this entire period here has been about God taking back what is his and taking it away from Satan. Right now, Satan is known as the God of this age, the prince of the power of the air. He ro roams about the earth as a lion seeking whom he may devour. Um, now, he's doing that more now at, at this point in Revelation's history than ever because prior to Revelation chapter 12, when Michael stood up, this war in heaven. Satan, um, we could say, had his wings clipped. He was kicked down before he's been the accuser, ever before the throne of God accusing the saints. And we see, we saw that also. We will see that. We see it in Revelation chapter 20, among other places, but that's a, a big one. Where he's accusing the saints. We saw this in Job chapter 1 and 2, where um, the devil, the accuser, is before the throne of God and is accusing the saints. Michael stands up in Revelation chapter 12 and he's thrown down to the earth. So the devil is very angry and we see him react. And we see the way he reacts against, um, he possesses Antichrist and that's where he becomes the beast. That's where the Antichrist becomes the beast. It's, it's just as Judas was possessed by Satan, um, now we have Antichrist possessed by Satan, and he's angry. He knows it's time is short, so he goes on a rampage. So he takes out the two witnesses, goes into the temple, defiles the Holy of Holies. Um, at some point in there, he meets um, another beast, the false prophet, as we know him. And uh, an image is set up, and he begins his beast system, his economic system. And so, you know, now he's got his scorched earth policy going, and he's trying to wreak havoc with God's creation. And meanwhile, in uh, he, he's, uh, he's already losing by inches, dying by inches, as Jesus pours out plagues and things upon the earth, creates calamity that shows that he is sovereign God. He's the one in charge. And what we will see with these bold judgments is we will see um, that Christ in these plagues is showing him who's boss and who's really sovereign over the earth in similar ways that God showed Pharaoh and the Egyptians who's really God who was really king. Remember the plague of Egypt um, used gods that Egypt worshipped to infest them and to, and to um, dominate over them and to show them that he is sovereign God. So we have something very similar here. And indeed, when we get into these bold judgments of wrath, we see um, a repetition similar to those 
plagues of Egypt, um, but of course on a on a global scale now, not just over Egypt. Now we're looking globally, except for the area where um, God's remnant are hidden. That could be Petra. So this is happening in Jordan, where old Edom is, and Moab um, in the hills. So they are hidden there. That's why a lot of scholars will say, well, this, is, this sounds like it's, it's in Petra. And that's a unique location. We looked at that um, in former weeks. But what, so this cloud where no one could look, no one could enter the temple. If you can't go in there and God is, is hiding himself in that glory and that smoke in the temple, uh, I'm thinking he perhaps wants his focus to be on the sun. Um, the Lamb of God, really now the Lion of Judah, well and truly, he is um, certainly acting more like a lion than he is with uh, than he is a lamb. Um, so he wants all eyes focused on what is going on on the earth now, instead of on him on the throne. Hey, look at my son. This is my son. So he's they're very proud of um, the son. Looking upon him, the Father wants that focus to be there. And uh, we know the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit does is he doesn't do anything or say anything to glorify himself, but he lifts up the Son. So now all the focus is on the Son, and it's going to be upon the final actions upon the earth, where he takes it back, and then there's going to be the second coming of itself. And everything all through history has been pointing to this moment as one of the key moments, of course, the ultimate key key moment um, that we're most familiar with that's already happened was on the cross, and that was our redemption. This is perhaps greater because there's more about the second coming in biblical prophecy than there is the first coming, the first incarnation. So this um, is part of bringing all those promises, including the cross, so that we can have redemption to a moment where uh, we had paradise lost back in Genesis, and now we have paradise found. The other thing I want to look at here with um, chapter 16 is we're looking at the wrath of God. Now, we first saw wrath back in chapter 6, correct? Um, we did discuss this this last week. Um there's all this calamity on the earth that begins with the opening of the seals. And the observation observation that's made toward the end of that chapter is, is wow, folks, we're looking at the wrath of the Lamb. Behold, the wrath of the Lamb has come. So it's an observation of what's already upon the earth. It's not a proclamation of what's on its way. These are um, people, the, the, um, the wealthy, the military, uh, all those folks hiding in dumps deep underground um, military bunkers, and they're hiding in their caves. They're hiding out with their extra rations of food and so forth because of all the calamity on the earth back in the seals in chapter 6. And they're making this observation um, that this is kind of the stuff that all those right-wing wacko Bible nuts were talking about. And it, and it was, but as bad as that was, uh, the trumpets were even greater. The seal judgments happened on a scale of one-fourth quarters. And then when we had the we had the trumpets come along, we saw things happening on a scale of one-thirds of what was left. So put in terms of the population, we're at roughly about... Um, we're at roughly 8 billion people right now. Let's look at the, the in terms of, of um, casualties. So in the seals, you have one quarter of the earth, the population wiped out. That leaves 6 billion people. And then you get to the trumpets and you get another third wiped out. One third of six is another 2 billion people wiped out. So half the world is gone by then. And that does that's just... Uh, that doesn't count um, normal, regular, everyday loss of life and so forth. And and so it's the population, they're trying to bury the bodies. I can't imagine how horrific that is. We went through the numbers before, and I'm not going to belabor that again, but there's no way that there's enough time 
and all the earth for the survivors to take care of all the bodies. So the corruption that's happening, the disease that's happening, God has stopped the rain, the earth is drying out. Um, this is his wrath on the earth. It's not going to be a fun time. So now we're getting into the Great Tribulation. Great in terms of um, scale and, um, you know, horrors that are going to happen. Not not great in a way where it's wonderful by any means. So this, this is just going to be a calamitous, calamitous time. And Jesus said of this time that never has such a time like it ever come upon the earth and it never will again after that. That is why 70 AD does not work because Jesus said that of um, the time called the Great Tribulation. And since 70 AD, we've had the First World War, we've had the Second World War, all those were more calamitous and loss of life was much greater in the World Wars. So it wasn't 70 AD. Well, this that's coming that's yet future for us is the Great Tribulation that, as Jesus said, is nothing has ever been so bad before that time and, and nothing will ever be that bad again. So we're here, we're in it now. So now we have wrath. As we've learned before, such terms as um, as the day of wrath, the day of the Lord, um, that generation, the latter years, etc., um, they all they all culminate in a literal day, a literal twenty-four hour day. But as we've seen before, that day, the latter years, those days, speaks more to an epoch or an era, a period of time. So it's not necessarily a 24-hour day, although it, it does, um, it, even in some examples here, it does point to some specific, to a specific day. But sometimes when it speaks of an era or in those days, it'll mention everything, it'll name everything happening from um, what we see with the restoration of Israel coming back into the land, which began in 1948, and we'll see its ultimate fulfillment in the kingdom. It covers everything in between. So it talks about um, Israel coming back into land and, and being called back into the land, and it also will speak of judgment, the judgment of the nations, and it'll speak of God's vengeance upon them, and then it'll even go into the kingdom, and all in one passage. So it'll cover this panoply of history that is covers the you know what you really would call um, the final generation on the earth. In Amos nine. Um, it is this period is called the restoration of Israel. In Ezekiel 30, it's a time of doom of the nations. The doom of the nations is the great tribulation, right? Um, Ezekiel 38, it is the latter years, and it includes wrath. Ezekiel 38, where with Gog and Magog. Um, it, in verses uh, 17 to 19, for instance, you'll read God speaking of his great fury, the fury of his wrath, and so forth. Different terms, depending on the translation you're looking at. Jeremiah 30 is a key, important passage. In verse 2 of Jeremiah, it is first the restoration of Israel back into the land. In verse 7, it includes the time of Jacob's trouble, or the tribulation. And in verses 8, to nine, it includes the Messiah establishing his kingdom. That's a perfect example of one of those passages I, I mentioned that's really more prevalent than you might believe in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 24, it is that day, yet in Isaiah 25, that day also brings restoration in the establishment of the kingdom. So you have that day, but you also have the kingdom. In Isaiah 61 2, it is the day of vengeance. In Isaiah 34 4, and this is interesting. Tell me when you've heard this before. Wrath rolls the sky up like a scroll. And, and it's speaking of this in terms of during the tribulation, this time of wrath. Now, is this recorded at all in the book of Revelation? Some people will try to liken it to 2 Peter 3, where um, you know, there's a new heaven and there's a new earth and uh, the sky is rolled up like a scroll and, and great fire and fury. And they'll say that, um, which I have done in the past because it's the way I learned it. So this is the new heaven and new earth. It's going to be um, great nuclear catastrophe. Everything's going to be annihilated and then God's going to make a new heaven and new earth. <clears throat> well, the 
The context here is about the tribulation. Now look, we have the sky is rolling up like a scroll in the seals in chapter 6. The sky rolls up like a scroll. As we've discussed before in, in um, various Hebrew idioms, they'll use exaggerated, exaggerative language. We use them more than probably what you think about. You know, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. There's an example right there. Um, so they tend to use that type of language to make a point. And it's very common in Hebrew writings. So literally the sky was not rolled up like a scroll or after that particular seal judgment that was opened up, everybody would have been dead in minutes, right? So it's just to use exaggerative language to demonstrate how furious the um, God's wrath is and how destructive it is. So um, what's going on in Second Peter 3, and we will at some point look at uh, more at this, but in Second Peter chapter 2, um, the context is the wickedness that's on the earth. So it's not new heaven and new earth. With chapter 2, um, Peter's going into all the wickedness that's on the earth, and then in chapter 3, it's God's time of wrath, fury upon the earth, great fire and things like this that's mentioned, and um, scorching the earth and so forth. Well, guess what? We're getting into that right now in chapter 16, and that's why we're addressing it now, because this is the the climax of the tribulation, the great tribulation. We do literally see fire upon the earth and the sun acting up and so forth, and this is God's wrath. Uh, um, so the following chapter, 35 in Isaiah, um, is about the kingdom that follows. So it talks about all the fire on the earth and destructiveness and so forth. And 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 then it talks about um, about the, the kingdom on the earth, new heaven and new earth. So new heaven and new earth happens between the tribulation and going into the kingdom. It, it has to. You see the destruction coming upon the earth here. Jesus cannot just make millennium kingdom on the earth without remaking, without restoring it. It's impossible. There's no water at one point. There, um, everything's been scor scorched. The, all the water, all the water has been turned to blood. Uh, the decaying bodies everywhere, that's not kingdom, folks. And as we've read so often in the Old Testament, that's not what the kingdom looks like. The new heaven and new earth uh, of necessity, Jesus must restore. And we'll see a lot more about this when we get into chapter 20, but especially chapter 21, and um, the timing of all of that. But but go with me here. Um, so that's the, the end of the tribulation. That's not the end of the millennium when we see the new heaven and earth. Why would God, at the end of the millennium, have all this fury, wrath, and fire and everything? That was the kingdom. You know, the time of vengeance, the time of all the wrath and this fury was during the tribulation. It won't be during the millennium. Um, even when Satan is temporarily loosed at the end of the millennium, he's put down at a word, it says. So it's not even Armageddon. It's not even as, as messy and as big and um, all, you know, all the blood up to the horse's bridles and all that that we see in Armageddon at all. It's just the Lord puts him down at a word at the end of the millennium. And it was just this final last hurrah. And uh, then it's over. So anyway, um, so see Isaiah um, 65 and read that. And, 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 and so you want to read the chapter before and, and read that and see the context and the flow. Time-wise, is just as I've stated. In Amos 8, that day, God will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth. In Zechariah 9, on that day, the Lord their God will save the remnant of Israel. And in Zechariah 12, on that day, all the nations of the earth will gather against Jerusalem and will God will destroy them. In um, Zechariah 14, no, Zechariah 13, on that day, God will judge them for their idols. Zechariah 14, on that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives and living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem and the Lord will be king over all the earth. 
Um, in Joel 1 and 2, the day of the Lord is near as destruction from the Almighty comes in pity upon the children of Zion as the Lord pours out his spirit. And then in Joel 3, the nations are judged in the valley of Jehoshaphat and the grapes are reaped, trampled underfoot. Also in Joel 3, God restores Judah and Jerusalem. In Matthew 7, during judgment on that day, many will say to him, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, etc., etc. You know the famous horrific passage. And he will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, and so forth. So that, that will happen after the tribulation. That's during the sheep and goats judgment that we see there at Matthew 25, uh, toward the end. In 2 Thessalonians 1, on that day he will be glorified in his saints. That's on that day. In 2 Timothy 2, no, 2 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, on that day henceforth there is laid up for us the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award. And that will be at the Bema seat uh, for the believers and, and uh, to all who who have loved his appearing. So let's let's take a look at this. Let's um, revisit one thing I wanted to look at here. And that is this slide here. So as formerly noted, there are no prophecies concerning Israel uh, other than the scattering to the nations, to all the nations on the, on the earth. From the first century and um, until the various restoration passages begin being fulfilled. And, and that we began seeing that really in 1948, where God is restoring the land. And it was desert up to that point. And, and we know that that's not a future, it's something else that's going to happen later on because um, the land in these prophecies is described as a desert, but God's going to restore them and replenish them and bring people in. Well, in order for this to be a future prophecy, even from 1948, Israel would have to become a desert again and become peopleless again, effectively. And that's not going to happen. So, so God's already begun the process, and it started in 1948, and it's all part of um, that day or days are coming or generations of his wrath or a time. And in those days, those that same type of phrasing again uh, in the latter years and so forth. So they describe events, again, from the beginnings of the restoration of Israel as a nation in the land itself, um, the time of Jacob's trouble, judgment of the nations, and then establishment of the kingdom, or even sometimes final judgment is, is um, indicated in some passages. So they are described in terms of the end of the last days as one particular grand era, the fulfillment of all future prophecy concerning God's judgment and restoration of his judgment, um, fulfilling all of his promises in his son, uh, um, glory upon the earth. And so in Revelation chapter 6, that was all introduction, by the way, 30 minutes of introduction. So in verse 1, so then I heard a loud voice from the temple. We saw this in chapter 15, right? So he's in the temple, the sanctuary, telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So John is on the earth hearing a loud voice from the heavenly temple. We saw that in, in chapter 15 because he says that I heard the same thing here. I heard from the temple. Uh, this We see the same type of thing in, in um, chapter 15. So God's wrath has been ongoing since chapter 6. Notice what follows is um, the first three plagues or the first three bowls are directed at the worshipers of the beast. Because the, what have they been doing? Um, they have um, taken the mark and in order, it's not the mark itself that did it. In order to take the mark, they've got to worship the beast, pay allegiance, homage, worship um, the Antichrist, worship the Antichrist possessed by Satan. So they're worshiping the dragon himself, the serpent himself, before they're taking the mark. And so um, these all fall upon those who follow him. And then the remaining four concern Babylon, the, 
global Babylonian system that is Antichrist's system, the beast's system uh, upon the earth. And so now we begin in in um, in earnest as the go out and they begin to pour the on the earth the uh, seven bowls of the wrath of God. And um, verse two, so the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. This is similar to um, the sixth plague in Exodus. The Exodus passage in uh, Exodus 9.10 says, so they took soot from a kiln and stood before Pharaoh and Moses threw it toward the sky, and it became boils breaking out with sores on man and beast. Um, here's an interesting prophecy that I, don't, I can't recall ever having happened yet, so I think it's future, and it might have to do with this particular time, because it's future for us, and I think we're really at the end here. Deuteronomy chapter 28, we're going to look at two verses, verse 27 and, and then we'll look at verse 35. You feel free to read the whole chapter, pause this if you want and do it, but we're going to read just note, we're just going to note those particular few verses. So in verse 27, the Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt. In other words, saying, hey, you remember the boils back in Egypt, Moses' day? The Lord's going to strike you with that. And with tumors and scabs and itch of which you cannot be healed. This is different from in Moses' day, right? In those days, that was healed, and people got over it. Um, but this, you cannot be healed. This is going to take you right up to the end. So those people who are experiencing the very first bowl of sores, they're stuck with them now for however long um, this goes on. We, This is the thing that's kind of an enigma, too, and so often we're reading prophecy, is, is the time jumps, the time lapse, the durations. So we know that um, Antichrist stood in the temple and, and declared himself God, making himself God. Um, we've got the number of days that are left remaining. We know um, it's at the three and a half year mark. So this began here. We don't know how long um, he was setting up his beast system and giving people opportunity to come flowing forth to take the mark. We don't know if there's one staging area and they've got to come all the way to Jerusalem. Probably not to take the mark and to worship. Probably there are staging stations set up elsewhere, all over the world. FEMA camps, you know, elsewhere in the world. Your local Walmart in the parking lot. Hey, come here and get your mark. You know, all you got to do is, you know, bow down and worship the beast, his image, whatever, take the mark, and then you can shop. We, we don't know how long that period is. Um, you know, is, it, is it a matter of months? Is, is it a matter of a year or two? So the, the bowls now are going to be in more rapid succession toward the very end. The scripture does not tell us. Your guess is as good as mine. So whatever happens, though, whether it's a year left or whatever uh, um, in these bowl judgments, I believe they do happen in succession because it calls it the first bowl, second bowl, third bowl. But we don't know. I don't think that most of these happen and then have an ending before the next one begins. And here we see in Deuteronomy that it happens and it looks like you've got it. You're, there's no cure. You're going to deal with it until the very end. Um, we we saw, for instance, um, in the pit, when Abaddon was released from the pit, we did see where um, demonic creatures came out, and the first ones that came out were the smaller ones that looked like scorpions, the little beasties come out, and they're torturing, tormenting people with their stings, and people want to die and aren't even able to die, and death takes a holiday. We saw that this happens for five months. What happened to them afterwards? The Bible doesn't tell us. Did they go back into the pit? I don't know. Are they waiting until some back, some last point at the very end to to be set loose and release fury again? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say that. It just says this particular thing that happened this in, in, in the first of the woes there was um, you know, a five-month thing. And then this demonic horde came of horse-like creatures with demons on them, 
and heads like lions, but not really, you know, they sting with their tails and fire out of their mouths and weird creatures. And we saw there's 200 million of those. And uh, we, when we discussed that back in, in uh, chapter nine, and there's no duration named in that particular one. So that was um, after the beasties, you had this horde of 200 million and they cover the earth, I guess, and we don't see where there's an ending of that. So during all this time, they're still out there. You've got one or two every square mile uh, upon the earth, uh, the surface of the land mass of earth, which is roughly about 200 million. Um, so you, you know, oh, look out, I heard he's over in this neighborhood. You know, they're over here or whatever, and people are avoiding him. We don't know. It just kind of, the scripture kind of, mentions it says hey this is poured upon the earth this is what happens and then it moves on to these items this checklist of things that uh is god releasing upon the earth uh same kind of thing here so verse 35 did i mention verse 35 of of um, daniel 28 says the lord will strike you on the knees and on the legs with grievous boils of which you cannot be healed again from the sole of your foot to the crown of your head so that's going to be a horrific time now, here's another thought too. Boils are often the result of something internal, an infection that's working its way out. So it works its way out and it becomes boils on the body. Now, yes, on a spiritual level, God's punishing them for taking on themselves the mark and worshiping the beast. But another question, though, is whether this is a bad reaction as a result of something bad in the mark that infects them, whatever, whatever the mark looks like, however it's whether it's something that's injected, something put on top of it, we don't know, we won't be there because you have to have a beast before you can have a beast system in his mark. You gotta have somebody that's that people are gonna be worshiping first to take the mark before you can have the mark of the beast. So there's nothing like these shots that are going down now or any of this type of thing that is the mark of the beast. That's all prep work, I'm sure. I'm sure somehow it all comes into play, but anything that's happening right now is not the mark of the beast. First, you gotta get the beast. That doesn't happen until the middle of the tribulation period. So I don't know if, if, if it's a result of something in that that causes an infection. Um, we, we just simply don't know. So um, in the um, plagues of Moses, the very first plague of Moses was blood. Um, this picture that's depicted here shows... Um, you know, it, it's a nice, pretty red, and um, but that's little critters upon the earth. It's a red tide kind of a thing, and it happens every once in a while, and it's not really blood. In Exodus chapter 7, we read this. So Moses and Aaron did even as the Lord had commanded, and he lifted up the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood. Now this is a little bit, this is a little bit different here. But but first let's let's take a quick look at. Um, well, the passage says here in in chapter sixteen, it says the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. I'll bet. So it's not going to be this pretty red that you see here. Corpse blood is darker, gloppy, quite horrific. Corpse blood is, you know, it, I can't imagine what the stench must be like, but it's not going to be um, something that anything can live through. And so uh, everything dies. Everything dies. Um, we saw similar in, in Revelation, second angel sounded, remember, in, in Revelation 8, 8 and 9, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, so it's something volcanic, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life, they died, and then a third of the ships were destroyed. Um, you're not going to have engines working and turning, and you know, a lot of the ships that are out there get their cooling from the water and so forth. And it's going to end. And how does a, a ship float in this, you see, thick blood? I mean, it's, it's going to, it's not going to work. 
the screws aren't going to turn to make them move, nothing. It's just going to be awful. In Revelation 11, 6, um, these, the, speaking of the, the two witnesses, they have the power to shut up the sky, in other words, from rain, so that rain will not fall during the days of the prophesying, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. So probably what happened in Revelation 8 was something that the two witnesses had called down. Um, and I, we went in before about how I think uh, it makes more sense that the two witnesses begin at the beginning, that, that when the two witnesses are described in chapter 11, that um, it's kind of a flashback, a parenthetical to catch us up to, up to speed. So they have the two witnesses at the beginning, and then uh, they are killed by the beast, Satan, in the middle. Um, and because of all the partying and things that happens as a celebration and exchanging gifts. Well, as you're going to see by the end of the bowls here, there's not going to be gift exchanging and party atmosphere at all. Um, so we'll push that back to the beginning, the first half of the tribulation week. So, so here we got the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became blood like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea died. Then um, we're getting ready to see the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of waters, and they, become, they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous are you who are and who were. Um, some translations will say, um, and is to come, or and is, so forth. Um, some translations leave that out and just say, Righteous are you who are and who were. O Holy One, because you judged these things, for they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you've given them blood to drink. They deserve it, is what it says. So let's um, click through these slides real quick. And again, the, um, these images that we see are red tide, but they kind of give you a, a hint of, of how awful that's going to be, if you can imagine um the scope of it so my question comes up here's my question about all of this is what do they drink um now with no water so if you've got a period of even just months left on the earth um how long will we, we've seen because of covid and things like this we've seen runs on the store all the supplies toilet paper and water and so forth people grabbing it up what will it be like then and then, and then um you know it's going to be like the in in the old ten commandments with charlton heston where uh pharaoh's magicians are are pouring cisterns into the nile to try to restore it and the next thing you know out of the cisterns blood's coming out of that too well people open up the bottles of water and and it turns into blood. And so they're going to be running around freaking out looking for juice. But they're also looking for alcohol eating wine. And there's a lot of Bible prophecies that talk about in the very end and the wine in the very end and the shortage of wine and people mourning and so forth. So wine is more, it's more than just some way for people to drown their sorrows or troubles. But we see where there's a real glut here of um, available something to drink. Industry is dead by this time anyway, right? We've we've got look at the calamity happening upon the earth, and are people can't be getting in their cars and driving to work at this time. You know, this everything's supply chain is is beyond broke at this point. So for the remaining time, um, the earth dwellers will turn to wine and strong drink to to sate their thirst. Um, Revelation seventeen one. If you if you're in Revelation, just Flip ahead one chapter it says, Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. That, that's an example of that. Now, who are the kings of the earth? Because you, you say, well, this is this is Babylon, so uh, the Antichrist is in charge, right? Well, remember um, the little horn, the little horn that raised up, and he took over three and became one of the horns, and then 
he's one of the rulers, and then he's got ten horns under him. Where you've got in uh, Daniel chapter two, you've got the ten toes, and there those are the ten kings, the ten rulers. So you've got ten horns. Yeah, on the dragon, you've got ten horns. So these are rulers, um, prefects, presidents, kings, whatever, co-regents with the Antichrist ruling on the earth, the Antichrist, of course, um, ruling over all them. So um, the, though there are still kings on the earth. The, the um, seven heads on the dragon or the seven hills, um, I, I tend to lean towards knowing that we're talking about a global system here. It's not a particular city, although the seat of Satan might be in Babylon. Some will say actually in Rome. Some will point elsewhere. Some people will say New York, and we've already discussed some of these possibilities. But regardless of that, we're talking about a global system. The seven continents um, are hills that peak up out of the water, the oceans. So there are seven hills on the earth, seven continents on the earth, and um, and we know it's a global system. So that's kind of the way I lean, knowing, just speaking in terms of upon the earth, upon the earth, upon the earth, because everything is global, and it talks about on the whole earth repeatedly ad nauseum in the book of Revelation. Um, interesting passage is Isaiah 24, uh, if, you want to, if you want to flip over to there. You almost need to keep one finger in Isaiah for all these things concerning the end time, but concerning judgment on the whole earth, if you go down um, and let's see, verse one says, behold, the Lord will empty the earth and make it desolate and he will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants. We'll look down at verse five. The earth lies defiled under its inhabitants for they have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are scorched, and we will see that in a minute here, and few men are left. The wine mourns, the vine languishes, all the merry-hearted sigh. And then look real quick at verse 11. There is an outcry in the streets for lack of wine. All joy has grown dark, and the gladness of the earth is banished. Then, um, quick note, Joel 3 will say similarly in Joel 3. It says, uh, For behold, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there. And this has got to be, you know, it's, you know yeah. Armageddon's a, a place of, the Valley of Megiddo is a place of, of judgment upon the nations, of course, in the Valley of uh, uh, Megiddo, where the Mount, Mount Megiddo is, and he's trampling the grapes and he judges them. But it's also the sheep and goats judgment there in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. So he's going to enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and they've divided up my land. So bad things happen when you try to divide up Israel. But it's going to happen in the end, and, and here we, this is one of the results of that, God's wrath, and have cast lots for my people, and have traded a boy for a prostitute, and have sold a girl for wine, and have drunk it. So imagine how horrific that is. There's no water upon the earth. People are looking for things to drink. All the bottled water is gone. No more fruit juice left. They're drinking whatever alcohol they can find because they're thirsty, and, and some people will be trading their children or other people's children for wine. So it's going to be a barbarous and, and horrific time upon the earth. Um, it's just almost unimaginable. So again, here's the, the bowl. Rivers and, and springs are turned into blood as well. So it's it's not just a matter now of, of um, the oceans. And Again, we've we've seen this type of activity elsewhere in the world that looks very similar. And this is just for visual, but it's going to look a lot worse. For one thing, there's not going to be buildings standing in the background and so forth. But then we come to this, as we, we just saw in um, in Joel, and and the sun burns mankind in the fourth bowl. Um, now the Lord said to Moses, "Stretch out your hand in Exodus chapter nine." Toward the sky that hail may fall on all the land of Egypt, on man and on beast and on every 
plant of the field throughout the land of Egypt. Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran down to the earth. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very severe, such as had not been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Um, we saw similar <clears throat> about the rest of mankind um, and blasphemy and, and how with the curse for blasphemy in the Old Testament would be stoning. Um, so worshiping demons, false gods, and so forth, this is blasphemy. In Revelation 9.20, uh, we'd already had um, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues uh, up to that point did not repent of the works of their hands. So I'm thinking that that was speaking of Gentiles, at least by the time you get up into Revelation chapter 9, verse 20, where you had those the demonic beasties and the horde released, people still didn't repent. Um, they didn't repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. So that's blasphemy. So now we've got hail coming, stoning. And it's man-sized hail. Um, look at, um, look back from chapter 9 to chapter 8, verse 9. says, uh, the, the trumpet, the first sounded, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood. And they were thrown down to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. So this is all God's judgment upon the earth. And I would remind you, too, that sun worship had its origin on Sh uh, Shinar with Nimrod. Um, so Babylon is where all the paganism um, begins and ends um, with Nimrod, the first dictator upon the world. Uh, it's, it, Nimrod, by the way, Nimrod is interesting. Nimrod translates as we will rebel, and rebellion does. Here's some imagery that shows us the magnitude of the sun next to the earth. And I don't know if you're familiar with the CME, but um, there's such a thing as a kill shot where the sun um, will release um, a burst of flame toward the earth. And um, in this particular case, the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and it was allowed to scorch the earth or scorch the people with fire. So they were scorched by the fierce heat, think 2 Peter chapter 3, and they cursed the name of God. So there's more blasphemy who had power over these plagues. And here, they did not repent and give him glory. But in my opinion, you had chapter 9, the Gentiles, um, no more repented, no more saved Gentiles. Chapter 12 you had repentance, but there were Jews. Israel, God, um, said in, um, well, Jesus warned what to look for in the Olivet Discourse. We found also in Second Thessalonians 2 what the signs would be about the Antichrist, who he is. And so you know, lots of Jews were, are going to repent when they see Antichrist showing his true colors. Um, and standing in the temple, so that chapter 12, and we know in chapter 12 that they ran forward, God went before them. We find a passage in the Old Testament how God goes before them and clears a way for them to get off toward Edom and Moab, basically Jordan, and to hide off in the hills. And um, we read in Zechariah that uh, half of Jerusalem leaves, and um, only one-third of the rest of Israel leaves to hide into the hills. And that leaves behind um, a great block in Israel um, to be judged. And um, read Micah sometime, the, the whole book of Micah about the judgments that fall upon Israel. And we don't really read much about it in the book of Revelation. But Israel stands in judgment, too, for um, her harlotries, worshiping other false idols, worshiping the gods of Babylon. And so they've taken, many of them have taken the mark and they've bought into it. And so, but now we've got chapter 16 here and they did not repent and give him glory. So of those folks remaining um, elsewhere on the earth in Israel, 
in Judea, they did not repent. So no one else is saved at this point, in my opinion. I mean, no one else. Um, so this is um, for, for blasphemy. And like what happened in um, Exodus, where you had the Jews hidden in the land of Goshen, they were protected there, protected from fire, hail, darkness, the flood, and that type of thing. Um, but when we get to the very end here, there's there's not going to be any any protection from any of that. Here's an image that shows the example of what it looks like when a kill shot gets fired off. Our Earth is protected by an electromagnetic barrier. It's like a force field that God built into the Earth. And so um, even those will be defected to a point, but a direct kill shot would be, um, you know, a literal kill shot on the Earth, and most people would die. And there's the scope of it. There's what the size of the sun looks like compared to um, an incoming kill shot that's coming from the earth. So um, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, we read in verse 22, for a fire, a fire is kindled by my anger and it burns the depths of Sheol. Sheol is an Old Testament idiom for the grave, um, not hell. It's more, it can refer to hell, but context will determine the meaning, but usually they refer to it as the grave. Devours the earth and its increase and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. In Malachi chapter 4, it's only um, about five verses, I think, but in Malachi chapter 4, we read, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like the, the stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on that day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb and all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Verse 5, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, which he did, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So these curses also apply to Israel, and he's warning them that Toward the end, it's going to be a curse, and it's going to be awful. Uh, Isaiah 24, 6, Therefore a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are scorched, and few men are, are left. Um, let's read 2 Peter 3, verses 10 and 11. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and we'll have a discussion concerning thief like a th coming like a thief next week. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So it's like what's going on here. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in, in, uh, in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of uh, the day of, of God, in verse 12, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will, be, will melt as they burn. Verse 13, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells, and that's following, so that's kingdom. So you've got the burning and the fire, the great tribulation, the day of the Lord first, and then you've got it waiting for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells, and righteousness dwells where? Kingdom. So you've got tribulation, new heavens and new earth, kingdom, even in Second Peter chapter 3, there's an order of events. Uh, Luke 21, starting verse 25. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fading with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud uh, with power with glory. So we're going to see in the future, we're going to see a great kill shot 
coming to the earth and it's going to be um, something unimaginable upon the earth. And all the things that were described in Bible prophecy um, well and truly come, come to pass here. Okay, so we'll end with this for the night, the fifth bowl, darkness in Babylon. And in um, Exodus chapter 10, we had read um, in the past, stretch out your hand toward the sky that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. Uh, and so Revelation 16, verses 10 and 11, we have, then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed on their tongues because of pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. So it could be pain because of spiritual darkness and the demonic activity involved in darkness. So this association of darkness with, with evil and the earth dwellers who are left, but we who are on the light, that's not going to affect us. But um, pain and darkness that you can feel might be because of the demonic activity on the earth. Remember, not just Satan was kicked down to the earth, but the one-third of, of fallen angels that are not of the elect angels um, fell with Satan. They're, up, they're loose upon the earth. So maybe pain associated with some of that activity. We have a strange thing in Joel chapter 2 about the Euphrates. Um, again, Euphrates comes into play again. And I don't know if this is um, the same horde of army that was released before in chapter 9 upon the earth. And then they all come home to roost in Jerusalem. But in Joel chapter 2, you see a weird thing happen. If you read that, the first 10 verses, and you tell me what this is about. Now, some will say that this is about the kings of the earth that cross the Euphrates and come in toward Jerusalem. But that's the next plague. That's that's the sixth bowl. That's not the fifth bowl. I mean, that's getting into to, um, uh, chapter 16, verse 11, I believe. But this is this is, this is is still the fifth bowl. Um, with the darkness upon the earth and the darkness that you can feel. Look at Joel chapter 2. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my mountain. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. Now here it's speaking, I believe, specifically of that one particular day when Jesus does return to the earth. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness, there is spread upon the mountains. A great and powerful people, listen to this, their like has never been before. Does that sound like the kings of the east? Their like has never been before? What does that mean? Nor will be again after them? Are you saying that there are no Asians in, in the kingdom? I don't think we're saying that, are we? So is that the kings of the east? I don't think so. So this is a very weird, strange thing going on here. Let me read that again. Chapter 2. Again, look at verse 2. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness there is spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful people. So people somehow, their like has never been before, nor, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses. That's why I was wondering, is this part of that horde from chapter 9? Because they were described that way. And like war horses, they run, as with the rumbling of chariots. They leap on the top of mountains like the crackling of a flame of fire, devouring the stubble like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Well, then look at verse 6. Before them, the peoples are in anguish. All faces grow pale. Like warriors, they charge. Like soldiers, they scale the wall. They march each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. 
They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city and they run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them and the heavens tremble. The sun and moon are darkened and the skies withdraw their shining. I'm not sure what this is. This is very strange. It's very difficult to understand exactly what we're reading here. Um, so once, once again about this, take a look at um, the strange verse in Daniel chapter 2. Look at Daniel chapter 2 before where um, it was about Nebuchadnezzar's vision and the the visage, the image, the statue, whatever. Um, and the, Daniel explains the dream to him. Look at the beginning of verse 42. And uh, the statue, remember we had the legs of iron and that's Rome and then we have a future version of it and its feet are miry clay mixed um, with iron. Verse 42 says, and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. Okay, because it's not a good mix. Verse 43, and as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men. They will mingle with the seed of men as opposed to the seed of what? But they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. So. As you saw, iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seeds of men. What's going to mingle with the seeds of men? This is kind of this is something to think about. Um, I, I don't know if you know we're looking at some form of transhumanism here. I don't know if we're looking at some strange thing where again we saw in Genesis six that you have fallen angels. Um, marrying and, and siring children with women and and um, having children with them and they grew up to become the Nephilim and then we ended up with the Nephilim and also the Anakim and all of these that happened. And it ha didn't happen just before the flood only, but it, uh, there's that phrase also in Genesis 6 and after this. So there was a time after the flood too and they happened again and we saw them in Canaan. Giants kept coming up. Now I'm not saying these are giants, maybe they are, but some type of of um, hybrid thing again with angels is Satan kind of cooking up his own army again and uh, they're going to be participating in what's going on and, and part of this darkness is this what we see coming flooding in toward Jerusalem in Joel chapter 3 during the darkness and so there's pain in the darkness also because it's just strange and I'm bringing this up because it's in the passage it's in Joel we read Joel all the time. We don't always read all of Joel, but somebody needs, needs to explain this. If this is not the kings of the east here in Joel because that's the next plague. That's the next bowl. That's the sixth bowl. This is during the darkness. So um, pray about it. You decide. But one thing I do know, we will continue with Armageddon. We know the Lord wins in all of this, and, and we have to remember that we're in spiritual darkness, and we're in a spiritual battle now. So we need to be putting on the whole armor of God. We protect our thoughts, our minds with the, the helmet of salvation, right? We're saved, we're delivered, put on the helmet of salvation. And so all our thoughts and everything act like it, the things you think about and protect your mind. Protect your mind from, from um, books and movies and TV shows that would seek to corrupt your mind and, and uh, um, be destructive to your walk in Christ. Walk in holiness. Um, Put on the, the breastplate of righteousness and, and um, protect yourself. Take up the shield of faith. Uh, faith is a gift from God, and he's given it to you to protect yourself from the fiery darts of the wicked one. One of the greatest aspects of the armor of God is, 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 is the Bible, the sword of the Spirit. And that's our only offensive weapon we have. When we quote scripture, if something happens, we we should be memorizing scripture. That's our, our weapon of choice. Have your loins girt about with truth. Walk in truth. Pursue Christ in truth. Um, not just on Sunday. In truth means you do it every day, all the time. And you stand up against false doctrine, false teaching. And you stop the false teaching and the false doctrine yourself. If you're engaging that or you learn 
that, oh, I've had some false ideas here. This is wrong. Stop doing that. Truth. Have your loins girt about with truth and have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Um, not just take the gospel and put it on your feet and stomp around it. No, you, you have to have your feet prepared. Do you know the gospel? Can you share the gospel with people? Are you prepared? Are you prepared no matter where you go from one day to the next when you're going to work or you're at the store or going to get gas or wherever you're going um, to prepare, to share the gospel with somebody? And this is what we need to be doing. We put on the whole armor of God. We put on Christ. It also tells elsewhere in Scripture that we put on Christ. We should be walking as Christ walks, and this should be um, every day, because we know the the time is near. The days are short, and uh, even so, we continue to look up and wait for Him, um, and uh, listen to that last trump, that last trumpet sound that's going to happen, because that's when we go. To, dwell with him and so shall we ever dwell with him for all eternity in Jesus name amen